We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Why should we care about anthropogeny? I have yet to meet someone who is not interested about their origins. And societies around the world have come up with a rich array of stories, origin stories, that try to explain where we come from as individuals, as societies. These stories range from omnipotent creators in the sky that created everything. They often involve features of, of the, the experienced landscape, including the sun and the moon, or features of the ecosystem, such as giant clams or important food items. And the collection of all these origin stories provides us with a rich heritage in really important stories, some of them extremely influential at a global scale. Since the advent of genomic technology and the possibility to compare DNA in all living things, we can actually use comparative studies of DNA to piece together the evolutionary tree of humans as mammals and primates. And this evidence shows us that we shared common ancestors with other primates several million years ago. For example, with chimpanzees and bonobos, their common ancestor had a common ancestor with us between six and eight million years ago. We also have hard evidence in the form of fossils, fossils of bipedal apes. Most of the old ones that are older than two million years are found exclusively in Africa and provide hard evidence for an African ancestry of our distant ancestors, eventually leading to larger bipedal apes with larger brains, smaller teeth, and eventually leading to our species with the modern human-like morphology of Homo sapiens. Just to remind you that the entire recorded history fits into this tiny sliver of time, the time between the invention of annotation and, and, and writing all the way up to Google is just 5,000 years deep and illustrates how deep into the past we need to look if we are to piece together the actual story of our origins. So humans have been around for about a third of a million years. For most of this time, there was no farming and no writing. Human societies consisted of, of small scale societies, much lower numbers of humans across the world, initially restricted to Africa until about 100,000 years ago. And the history of writing is at most 5,000 years old, which means there is no history. All of this is prehistory but played a really important role in shaping who we are today, because it's generations upon generations of people living in these small scale societies and surviving and producing the next generation, eventually leading to us. Now, interestingly, the last 12,000 years, which represents the, the last integration known as the Holocene, is when settlement first appeared and then farming. And the written record, again, is 5,000 years deep. It turns out that most of the information we have 
archaeological and written records is from this period. So whenever we talk about human origins, what I have observed is that we tend to revert back to where all the data are, all the information is located. Unfortunately, that is not the formative period of the species Homo sapiens, which is much deeper. It's the last 300,000 years, and we concentrate on much on the data from the last 10 to 5,000 years. Humans in modern times are jumping around places around the entire planet. This is due to technological advances, namely airplanes and jet engines. This is just one day's worth of global human behavior. It went down a little bit during the COVID pandemic and is now ramping, ramping back up again. But compare that to our closest living relatives, the great apes. Common chimpanzees here in, in East Africa, in Tanzania, and bonobos here in, in, the, in the Congo forests live on an area roughly the size of Pacific Beach and Mission Bay, 30 to 40 square kilometers, and patrol those very jealously in the case of common chimpanzees, even though bonobos can encounter a neighboring group, as you see in this picture, they usually reside on a relatively small territory, completely different from the pattern of global human behavior, facilitated by technological advances. But rather than just technology, humans have come up with a social cultural niche that consists of shared symbols, personal names, kinship terms that allow the formation of groups of groups or tribes, shared rituals, dance and music, sacred spaces, group identity and shared representations, and a much increased capacity to cooperate with and compete against other groups. Now, the goal of anthropogeny is to use a transdisciplinary approach to study the development and the interactions between humans and compare those to our closely related great ape species. We also rely importantly on archaeological data, ancient DNA data, and fossil data to interpret the phylogeny, the biological history of these species. We can compare these species to other species, including non-primates, importantly cetaceans, corvids, songbirds, and cooperative breeders. Very important data come from paleoclimate proxies such as drill cores, pollen, plant wax, soil carbonates, and stable isotopes. We also have the option to study developmental pathways using cells or organoids in vitro and translate the genetics, observe how the, the genotypes, the genetic information, translates into phenotypes. All this development happens, of course, importantly in an environment, and in the case of human, the cultural environment is paramount. This slide shows a short collection of biological features unique to humans that clearly are correlated with cultural behavior. I shall highlight two areas, the use of cooked food or cuisine and spoken language or language which can be signed or spoken and how these have affected human biology. Now, people studying humans often have important blind spot. Why? Because they are humans. Uh, this is one example. The, the giant of French anthropology, Claude Lévi-Strauss, wrote an entire book in 1964 called Le Cru et le Cuit, The Raw and the Cooked, in which he proposes that cooking is a purely cultural phenomenon and has no effects on biology. It's a very uh, hard viewpoint to defend these days that we know about the important differences in masticatory muscles and teeth and jaw and so forth. Similarly, biologists have commonly have important blind spots for cultural phenomena, such as language. One of the most famous evolutionary biologists, Bill Hamilton and E.O. Wilson, uh, try to explain human pro-social behavior simply by kin selection, the virtue that you can share more than average amounts of genes with other individuals, or reciprocal altruism. They didn't pay attention to the importance of reputation, third-party punishment, and so forth. Uh, in 2012, the late uh, E.O. Wilson actually published The Social Conquest of the Earth, in which he gave much more importance to social phenomena that seem to be unique to humans. It turns out that blind spots are shared with other primates. The Kiswahili proverb, Nyani haoni kundule, huliona la mwenziwe, means that the baboon does not see its behind, but regularly sees those of others. And this is a problem we suffer from in all human undertakings, but especially in anthropogeny. 
Now, both biology and culture are incredibly important for understanding our, our origins and our history. You all have come across the important quote uh, and famous quote that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution by Theodosius Dobzhansky. Another quote that is much less famous goes as follows. Human evolution cannot be understood as a purely biological process, nor can it be adequately described as a history of culture. It is the interaction of biology and culture. There exists a feedback between biological and cultural processes. Focusing on culture, it's become apparent that a person's beliefs and practices should be understood based on that person's own culture. We all struggle with this immensely as we are so used to our own norms and cultures and it's very hard for us to imagine how other cultures work. This cartoon is a good illustration of this. And what prevents us from understanding others often has to do with our narcissism and ethnocentrism. For example, we name the group of animals to which we belong primates from first. We name our species sapiens from knowing. We name stone tools invented in Africa after French towns like Acheulean or Le Valois. We name archaic hominids that lived across Eurasia after a German valley, Neanderthal. We name ancient humans from Africa arriving in Europe after French caves, Cro-Magnon. There is a long history of a European surprise at the mental capacity of fellow humans living as foragers because of a massive underestimation of the demands on cognition for these foraging traditional lifestyles. Similarly, in Africa, there's at least three different areas that are vying for primacy in where humans evolved, such as the cauldron of human evolution in the Afar Triangle in Ethiopia, the crucible of human evolution in Turkana, or the cradle of humankind in South Africa. Early ethnographers from Germany who had spent a quarter of a century in Southeast Asia came back to Germany with the conviction that there was such a thing as a psychic unity of humankind. Is it possible that we all share a basic biology and a mental framework? Is that that explains that my friend Umbugoshi, who is a Hadza forager and myself, can laugh at the same practical jokes, or that a key Swahili proverb about baboons works on an international audience? Or is the case that we cannot possibly understand others due to the differences in our lived experiences, for example, living in a mansion in La Jolla versus having to live as a homeless person in the same city? Let us hope that most of us become better at at least imagining the lives of others. We urgently need to do so in order to take better care of each other within and across societies. There's a lot of utilitarian arguments to be made for studying our human origins and engaging in anthropogeny. For medicine, human health and disease are profoundly shaped by evolutionary trade-offs, where things like survival and reproduction are actually causing completely different adaptations. Things like the hygiene hypothesis. No hygiene is bad for you, too much hygiene can be very bad for you as well. In terms of human reproduction, a lot of, of uh, industrialized societies have seen a massive delay in paternity, which can be biologically costly. Parents and mothers have stopped sleeping with their children or stopped bre breastfeeding altogether. All these things can come at a potential cost. In terms of nutrition, the, the more information on the importance of omnivory in our deep uh, ancestral past uh, will be part of how we will solve the feeding of soon to be 9 billion people on the planet. We're only beginning to appreciate the importance of what we eat on our microbiome and health. Educating and rearing children, uh, there is a lot of evidence for alloparenting, the role of, of adults other than the parents and grandparents who survive in humans as a very rare oddity in evolution. Similarly, the, the pro-social nature of human, the, 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 the documented inequity aversion that many humans have, and the concern for reputation could all be harnessed for increasing altruistic behavior. Violence in humans is, is, is profoundly male biased, both uh, within families, within groups, and between groups. There is potentially a role to play for, for much more female solidarity in controlling male violence. 
Technology is shaping the young minds and bodies. Cities are being planned uh, in, in an effort to mitigate some of the, uh, the effects of the Anthropocene and to improve social opportunities. Physical activity has huge impacts on minds and bodies and public health. And there is much information on traditional societies that have not settled and are still foraging and what their physical activity pattern look like. Finally, we, we are directly causing the sixth mass extinction on this planet and, and information on the importance of biodiversity at all levels, from large animals to plants to microbes, is extremely relevant to, to many of the current crises. We have become the planet-altering ape and are currently driving climate change. And so understanding how humans tick and how they got to this place of actually turning a very stable climatic period into a rapidly warming planet is really important. All these topics have been visited over the last 14 years with a lot of Carter Symposia, and we are hoping to, to have many future symposia to further discuss these important topics. Returning to the stories uh, and the curiosity of all humans about where they come from, it is embarrassing to admit that we still have no idea why we are bipedal, how old the use of fire is, why humans have a brain three times the size of their closest living relatives, how we humans became symbolic, how old language is, signed or spoken, or a combination thereof, and how it evolved, and most importantly, why it is only us that seem to be asking these questions. I'd like to end by congratulating our Carter member Svante Pabo on his Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And I would argue that this is, it hasn't been lost on, on the Nobel Committee that studying our deep history in the form of paleogenetics and essentially establishing a whole new research field and training many, many successful scientists who now have their own labs is, is worthwhile both to satisfy the profound curiosity that, that characterizes us humans and for its many applications uh, from medicine to many, many areas. So with that, I thank you very much. Early in my career, I took a gamble on neurolinguistics as a research path before it was even really a thing. It was just sort of dumb luck on my part, a case of stumbling onto the right thing at the right time. Now, neurolinguistics is firmly entrenched as its own subspecialization within linguistics, complete with its own society, journal, and annual conference venue. So in that sense, I do have something of a track record in anticipating future trends in the field, as evidenced by this piece I wrote around the turn of the century. On the other hand, for decades, I've been telling anyone who would listen to me that I suspected that genetics or neurogenetics would be the next big thing in linguistics. While that may still be the case, so far I can't really say that this prediction has panned out as well. This is not to say that there is no there there, but so far the genetic component of language hasn't come into sharp focus. Even though we know full well that genetics certainly plays a role in language ability, as recently reaffirmed by this study. What I'd like to do in this talk is first look backwards in time to ponder where we've come from in order to get a sense for where we are today and where we might be headed in future. Since I doubt that many of you are familiar with the history of linguistics, let me give you a selective, cursory, and warp speed helicopter overview of it. Just about any intro to linguistics course will sooner or later point out that a lot of what we do in linguistics has its roots in what the Sanskrit grammarians of India did several millennia ago. However, their analysis of language was deeply rooted in the ritual, culture, and religious practices of the time. The primary and arguably sole aim of analyzing language was to preserve its efficacy in the performance of the ceremonial rites that it, it accompanied. Likewise, I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration or oversimplification to claim that linguistics in the modern era really got its start with the discovery, quote unquote, by European imperialists of Sanskrit, the mother language of many, but not all of the modern Indian languages. Thanks in large part to the colonizing juggernaut of the British East India Company and its private huge military forces. The co-founders of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1784, which was modeled after the British Royal Society, were first of all, a typographer employee of the British East India Company, Charles Wilkins, and the British equivalent of a superior court judge in colonial India named William Jones. Both had studied Sanskrit with Indian pundits, who incidentally were themselves barred from membership 
in the Asiatic society until 45 years after its founding. The discovery, traditionally but erroneously attributed to Jones, of the distant relationship of Sanskrit to most of the European languages, gave rise in the 19th century to the heyday of so-called philology, the study of how languages are related to each other and develop historically, referred to in North America nowadays as historical linguistics. It's probably not entirely an accident of history that this important period in the study of language ran parallel to that of biology, and particularly to Darwinian theory of the 19th century. Virtually all of the 19th century linguistic superstars were a part of this philological tradition, including Jakob Grimm of Brothers Grimm fame, known in linguistics for Grimm's Law, which established these sound correspondences between Romance and Germanic languages. The bridge from the philological tradition of 19th century to 20th century linguistics was Ferdinand de Saussure, who is famous for two things. First, having posited the linguistic equivalent of the Higgs boson, before it was discovered, in the development of the Indo-European languages. And second, for laying out the structural principles of modern linguistics in a series of lectures at the University of Geneva, reconstructed from lecture notes by his students and published posthumously as course in general linguistics. So Sears' structuralist principles of language spread throughout Europe, not only in linguistics, but also within the field of literary criticism. Two of the three separate but related schools of European structuralist thought, namely those founded in Moscow and later in Prague, largely under the influence of Roman Jakobson, applied structuralist principles to both linguistics and literary criticism. Jakobson fled the Nazis and ended up in New York, where he was a founding member of L'École Libre des Hautes Études, established for French-speaking scholars after the German invasion of France in 1940, as part of the new school to which, incidentally, Parsons School of Design still belongs. It was here that Jakobsen came into contact with and influenced Claude Lévi-Strauss, the French anthropologist, who adopted structuralist principles and famously applied them to the study of human culture, notably kinship terms and later myth, which is, by the way, the topic of the Spring Carter Symposium. In American structuralism, interestingly, the influence tended to run in the opposite direction. Linguistics was heavily influenced by cultural anthropology instead. This was promoted by the intense research effort to study native North American culture and language, as both became increasingly endangered in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Franz Boas, often considered the father of the scientific study of language in the US, and his brilliant student Edward Sapir, both had lifelong appointments as anthropologists with research interests in language. However, Boas was primarily interested in language as a means to study culture, and Sapir had extensive interests outside of linguistics and anthropology, notably in psychology and in the fine arts. The other giant of early 20th century linguistics, Leonard Bloomfield, was a different case altogether. Bloomfield was never an anthropologist, although he too did field work on many native North American languages, and always held at least joint academic appointments in philology or linguistics. Bloomfield championed the autonomy of linguistics as a field of study in itself, independent of anthropology and psychology. It was also Bloomfield who sent linguistics down the path of behaviorism. While the Chomskyan revolution of the 1950s overturned that entire paradigm and returned linguistics to its mentalist foundations, it preserved the autonomy of language from other fields of study that Bloomfield had fought for. All of this has been requisite background for the possible path going forward that I'm going to lay out. But first, one more preliminary case study from the history of linguistics, namely the study of sign language. As many are now aware, American Sign Language was not even recognized as a linguistic system until the late 1960s and early 1970s, even though it had been in existence since the early 1800s. As a result, in the early years of sign language linguistic research, there was a concerted effort to distinguish the linguistic properties of sign language from mere gesture, as well as an emphasis on the arbitrary nature of the linguistic sign, one of Saussure's principles of language. The form of a linguistic sign is generally taken to be independent of its meaning. With sign language, this is a trickier argument to make, as many, though not all, linguistic signs have iconic origins, meaning they do often in some way resemble the things that they represent. However, this resemblance usually becomes attenuated and conventionalized over time, such that one often can't recognize the original iconic relationship without being told what it is. But now that sign language linguistics has staked out its conceptual territory, 
sign language linguists have begun to show renewed interest in investigating the iconic origins of many signs, as well as what is referred to as the gesture sign continuum, namely how gestural systems evolve to become fully linguistic. Now, the argument I would like to make here is this. Just as sign language has by now secured its status as a bona fide linguistic system and can therefore afford to examine more closely its own iconic and gestural origins without fear of compromise, so too can the field of linguistics as a whole, and the study of language evolution in particular, afford to loosen the stringent separation from its cultural and psychological and even artistic roots imposed over the past century. It's certainly the case that, as mentioned at the outset, Neurolinguistics has in recent decades gained a foothold within linguistics, and psycholinguistics and sociolinguistics have been around even longer. But while these subdisciplines are by now well established, they really bear only on the instantiation or implementation of language in real time and space. They aren't recognized as having much to contribute to the actual structural analysis of language. What I'm going to do next is show you one area of research I've been involved in with my graduate student Emily Davis over the past few years, that has led me to wonder if it might not be a good idea for linguistics to look a little farther afield than we've been used to, and specifically to those companion areas of study from which linguistics arose, and with which it was, to varying degrees, integrated throughout its history. If you don't pay close attention to debates within language evolution, for which you can be forgiven, for the past 20 or 30 years, there's been something of an elephant in the room, and that elephant is recursion the embedding of similar structures at increasingly higher levels of analysis, as shown in this example that you may be familiar with, containing recursive relative clauses. In language, recursion generally looks like this. The host knew the man who brought the woman who left, which branches to the right for languages like English or to the left in languages like Japanese. But it can also look like this, an example of so-called center-embedded recursion, the woman the man the host knew brought left. You may well think, oh, that's just not a grammatical construction in English, but it actually is. It means basically the same thing as the right branching version. The information is just packaged differently. The grammatical rules of English freely and legitimately generate this structure, as can be shown by changing the nature of the subjects in the embedded clauses. The woman someone I knew brought left. Now you should have no problem understanding this construction, even though the structural properties of both sentences are exactly the same. Linguists have long recognized this fact. This early study by Miller and Izard in 1964 concluded that these structures present a processing problem tied to limitations of short-term memory, rather than a grammatical problem. 20 years ago now, this science paper by Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch threw down the gauntlet in claiming that with regard to the evolution of language, nothing matters other than recursion. In this paradigm, basic perceptual, motor, and other cognitive abilities that support language aside from recursion, were more or less shunted to the periphery and not unreasonably posited to be shared at least in rudimentary form in common with non-human animals. The challenge that this approach poses is that it renders any plausible adaptive evolutionary account of recursion extremely difficult, as there's precious little evidence of this ability in the animal kingdom. But the authors of this paper simultaneously acknowledge that there could be another evolutionary path for deriving complex traits, such as recursion in language, that can't automatically be ruled out, and that is acceptation. One picture is worth a thousand words in this case. The feathers of dinosaurs are presumed to have evolved originally for purposes of thermoregulation, but then over time began to be used as well for sexual display and were eventually accepted for flight, which drove their further evolution. So Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch noted that recursion could have been accepted from other non-communicative domains of animal cognition, such as navigation, numerosity, or the structure of social relationships. This concession led to experimental investigations of the ability of non-human animals to produce or recognize recursive patterns, and more specifically, center-embedded palindromic sequences. This study by Zhang et al. tested the ability of macaque monkeys to reproduce a sequence of light flashes in either the original or reversed order, the latter of which is shown here. More impressively, Abe and Watanabe trained Bengalese finches to reliably associate pairs of notes extracted from their natural songs and center embedded such pairs of notes within each other. There are two things to note about these studies. One is that the form of recursion that the animals learned is center embedded. The other is that clearly language is not a prerequisite 
for the ability to recognize or produce center embedded structures because Bengalese finches and macaques can be claimed to do it and yet clearly don't have language themselves. This body of animal research was something of an aha moment for me because I've long been a fan of the work of the late Fritz Stahl, a Sanskrit scholar, linguist, and philosopher of language for decades at UC Berkeley. In 1975, Stahl helped to facilitate and organize a rare 12-day, 3,000-year-old Vedic rite performed in the state of Kerala at the extreme southwest tip of the Indian subcontinent. Stahl was allowed to document this 1975 performance in detail. This event made a huge impression on him and occupied his thinking for much of the rest of his career. He came to the same conclusion as other scholars of ritual, namely that what was important about these rituals was their internal structure and not their purported meaning. In fact, Stahl's analysis of Vedic ritual led him to conclude that more importantly, there was a form of hierarchical center embedding built into its structure, as you can see exemplified here. And this led him to the hypothesis that the use of center embedding in human and by extension in hominin ritual practice, and perhaps also in animal ritual, could have predated its use in language. In other words, center embedding, a form of recursion, could have been accepted for ritual practice. This was, to put it mildly, a controversial hypothesis. The question that this hypothesis raises is this. If center embedding in ritual practice underlies the evolution of recursion in human language, then why don't we see more evidence of it? Center embedding is famously infrequent in human language for reasons we saw earlier. It's often really hard to process in real time. Stahl observed that this was not a problem with regard to the structure of ritual, however, as it unfolds on a much more luxurious leisurely time scale, 12 days. As it turns out, this is equally true of a number of art forms that trace their origins directly back to human ritual culture. Despite my lifelong interest in the arts, I was until recently completely unaware of the fact that principles of center embedding play an equally prominent role in narrative poetry, music, and architecture. The classic Indian epic, the Mahabharata, consists of multiple embeddings of stories within stories within stories, a so-called frame structure, and in fact, Minkowski suggested that this structure was borrowed from ritual. This is just one example of a common literary device and means of literary analysis called ring or wheel symmetrical composition, which has been identified in books of the Hebrew Bible and in epics as culturally diverse as the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Song of Roland, Beowulf, 1001 Arabian Nights, De Camerone, and the Canterbury Tales, as well as in Shakespeare's plays, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and Tristram Shandy. However, center embedding is not merely a feature of entire works, but something that can be discerned at every level of literary analysis. For example, the so-called riddle hymns of the Rig Veda embed the enigma in the middle of the hymn and bracket it off with parallel stylistic, lexical, and morphosyntactic framing devices on either side of it in preceding and following verses indicated here in yellow and green. This kind of symmetric form has been identified in episodes and verses of the epics as well. Center embedding is likewise ubiquitous in Western music composition in every period and at every level of analysis, using musical gestures such as themes, motifs, rhythm, texture, color, and harmonic progressions. Aside from the sonata, symmetry is also built into the minuet and the rondo. The arch form, in which passages or movements are mirrored on the basis of key, tonal center, or contour, and retrograde composition, in which the music is identical on some parameter, such as rhythm or pitch, when played forward or backward, are common musical concepts. My graduate student Emily Davis noted that this type of symmetrical structuring extends to architecture, of which one of the foundational principles is in fact symmetry. This can be seen at the level of the most basic, traditionally temporal edifices constructed for Vedic rituals, subsequently burned to the ground at the conclusion of the rites. To the later permanent edifices of Indian Hindu, and Muslim culture, and actually in architectural traditions across cultures, This kind of symmetry likewise extends to many forms of artwork, ranging from ancient Greek pottery 
to contemporaneous configurations of emojis in today's digital world. So with regard to the question, if center embedding is so fundamental to the use of recursion in human cognition, why don't we see more of it? The answer is that, culturally speaking, its remnants are actually pretty ubiquitous. And the domains in which we have thus far identified it, namely in storytelling, music, and visual art, are not just random aspects of human cultural endeavor, but intrinsic aspects of human ritual, as any social or cultural anthropologist who studies ritual can tell you. This brings us back to Stahl's original proposal that the recursive structure of ritual ultimately provided the basis for the recursive structure of language. Coming full circle now, let me return to the main point of this talk. In taking a stroll down memory lane of the history of linguistics, I tried to emphasize the degree to which linguistics as a field had intimate connections with, as well as roots in, related fields of scholarly endeavor, including cultural anthropology and literary studies. The legacy of Bloomfield in the 20th century has been the intellectual autonomy of linguistics as a field of study. This independence of linguistics from its sister disciplines has resulted in amazing progress in the study of language over the past 65 years or so. However, the sands of time have been shifting in linguistics since the turn of the century, and I think it's perhaps not unfair to ask what comes next at this point, as the dominant Chomskyan paradigm begins to lose some of its inherent force. My suggestion here is that, just as the study of sign language has taken the brave step of reevaluating its origins in gesture and iconicity, so too would it behoove the study of language more generally to cast its net a little wider than has been the case in recent practice. This is not a novel idea. Studies in the evolution of language have for years been emphasizing the role that cultural factors play in shaping the structure of language as it is transmitted from generation to generation. All I am suggesting here is that the more general study of language might benefit from casting its glance backwards in time more often towards these more cultural influences, and also from entertaining the idea that enlisting the support of its sister fields, especially anthropology, psychology, and the arts, along with neuroscience and genetics, may help to broaden its scope and range of application in a profitable way to everyone's general benefit. Thanks for your attention. Ancient DNA analyses began almost 40 years ago with the technological advances associated with PCR and were immediately applied to questions about human population history. Um, one of the pioneers of ancient DNA research was Savante Pabo, who just won the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology, quote, for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution, unquote. In 1997, Svante Pabo led the first ancient DNA study of a Neanderthal to try to assess the relationship between Neanderthals and modern humans. And in this study, which I was part of, we used ancient DNA methods to retrieve a portion of uh, mitochondrial DNA. And the mitochondrial DNA genome, um, which is only inherited from your mother, um, it really kind of surprisingly, I guess, um, suggested that Neanderthals and modern humans were not related to each other uh, in terms of interbreeding. Um, and this was a major debate at the time. However, as I said, the mitochondrial DNA genome is, it's really a very small portion of our genome. And it's unlike the rest of our genome in that we inherit it only from our mothers. Uh, in 2010, the first study of the full Neanderthal genome was published, also from Svante's lab. And this, along with subsequent genome sequences from additional Neanderthals, as well as another archaic human known as a Denosovan, showed us that there was, in fact, interbreeding among archaic and modern humans. And here you can see that with the blue arrows. Uh, in the diagram, and each of these shows at least one admixture event. Um, so when you look at this, what you can see is that there were multiple cases of admixture at different points in time uh, among different hominins. And we see evidence of admixture between early anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals even prior to the major expansion of anatomically modern humans out of Africa 50 to 70,000 years ago. And 
this is likely something that happened during um, climatic periods when the Sahara was greener. Um, and that facilitated uh, expansion, sort of little movements out of Africa and interactions between kind of separated groups. Um, those were likely in the Middle East. We see evidence of that archeologically um, and the genome data now support that that uh, gene flow occurred. In addition, we see insights into the timing and um, number of admixture events. Um, we also see from the genome data, which, which includes some really high quality genomes, what kind of variation there was in the population, what kind of genetic variation, and what kind of adaptations. We can make inferences about those as well. And from the variation, or actually rather the, re the, the limited amount of variation found in archaic humans, we can infer that they had fairly small populations. Um, and we also see evidence of inbreeding. We can also compare the genomes of modern humans today to see how much DNA we inherited from archaic humans. And what we see is that non-Africans have about one to 5% archaic human ancestry, that is from Neanderthals or Denisovans. And the distribution of this ancestry is not even. So it's not even geographically when we look at populations from different places. Uh, for example, people in Southeast Asia, uh, island Southeast Asia in particular, and Australia uh, and the Philippines have more Denisovan ancestry. It's also not even across our genome, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Some of the archaic alleles that we have in modern humans appear to be adaptive. Uh, and examples have included alleles uh, related to immunity, skin pigmentation, and high altitude adaptation. Now, evolution, which is the change in allele frequencies from generation to generation, hasn't stopped. Ancient DNA analyses have also shown us that the forces of evolution, including selection, gene flow or migration, and genetic drift, have been important during the Holocene as well particularly related to the major shift in subsistence from hunting and gathering to agriculture. So what questions remain and how will additional ancient DNA data build on the initial findings related to human evolution? Um, first, we can think about this in terms of sort of who, when, where sorts of questions. Um, were there additional admixture events with other groups of archaic humans? If so, where and when? Um, we have limited data from Australia, Southeast Asia, um, and Africa in particular. And for example, we know, as I mentioned, that people in island Southeast Asia and Australia have more Denisovan ancestry. And you can see that here on the map. But we don't actually have Denisovan DNA uh, from that region, from, from actual um, bones. And uh, so, you know, what we do know from looking at modern human DNA with Denisovan uh, admixture is that there's likely a different source population in terms of um, the Denisovan population that contributed to that ancestry. So it's likely a different source population compared with the individuals who lived at Denisova Cave, um, or that contributed Denisovan ancestry to the people who live in, in mainland Asia today. Um, we can also use sedimentary DNA analyses and analyses of ancient proteins in places where there are no bones or there are only tiny, tiny bone fragments and this can be particularly useful in places where we have a very complex stratigraphy. So for example, at Denisova Cave, which is where we get the, the term Denisovan, um, you can see this very complex stratigraphy. And in these different occupation letter, layers, um, using these sedimentary DNA and uh, mass spectroscopy um, protein analyses, we can infer whether 
denosovin or Neanderthals or even both um, were living in the cave at that time. Uh, so that's a, a really exciting um, feature to be used at sites like Denisova Cave and, and elsewhere. Um, and in addition, ancient proteins actually preserve better than ancient DNA. And so these data can help push back uh, identifications back in time and place. We can also use both the sedimentary DNA and the ancient proteins to identify what animals these individuals were hunting. And as I said, in terms of identifying who occupied uh, the cave at certain time periods, we can see what stone tools were they using and then link potentially Denisovans to other sites um, where we don't have DNA or protein preservation and get a better sense of their distribution, both in time and space. Um, so I think ideally these methods will be um, used in combination with other archeological analyses and really let us put together a picture of a site for example, the use areas, if people butchered in one area and maybe slept in a different area, um, help us identify both plant and animal resources that, that they used, and even show us the biological relationships among individuals within a group so that we can make inferences about social organization. So in terms of what questions remain and how additional ancient DNA data can build upon this, we can also think about the legacy of archaic admixture in modern humans today. Um, so a number of, of really fascinating questions uh, remain, one of which is, why do we have so little Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry uh, today? Now, part of the reason is that anatomical, anatomically modern humans, in a sense, swamped out the smaller populations of archaic humans over time. But there's also evidence that some of this archaic DNA may have been deleterious or slightly deleterious. And um, analyses of an additional individuals who live soon after admixture events, uh, as well as computer modeling, can give us a better sense of how quickly archaic DNA was lost. Uh, in other words, sort of a sense of the cost, uh, if there was one, of archaic DNA in our own genomes. Um, and we can look at the so-called ancient DNA uh, or archaic DNA deserts in our genomes. So this map here shows a distribution of Neanderthal ancestry. Um, and this is taken from hundreds of genomes of Europeans and East Asians. Uh, East Asian genomes, the, the regions that are Neanderthal or have been found in in East Asian genomes to have Neanderthal alleles uh, are in red uh, and in blue are those that um, have been discovered in European genomes. And one of the things we see is several places where in neither group is there any Neanderthal ancestry, so these white areas. And so these are so-called archaic or Neanderthal deserts uh, in terms of the DNA in our genome. Um, and so we might ask why, is that by chance? Um, or is there something there that is important for being a modern human? And if so, what is it, what does it do? And how does it contribute to our phenotypes today? So functional analyses may help us figure out what these differences are between modern human and archaic human gene variants uh, in these regions. We can also think, you know, what have we um, gained in terms of alleles from archaic humans? What is the adaptive legacy? Um, Neanderthals and Denisovans lived in Eurasia far longer than, than we have, and thus likely adapted to the environment. Um, we've identified some variants that affect specific genotypes. Uh, or, or specific phenotypes, but these are what we know is very largely biased by the phenotype data that we have, which is mostly medical in nature in terms of having a, a real sense of the distribution linked to clear genetic genomic variants. Um, we also have a poor sense of more complex phenotypes, which 
are really most of the phenotypes we tend to think about. Um, and the phenotype genotype data that we do have is primarily from European populations. Um, we don't really have comparative data yet uh, for Denosovan variants, which are mostly found in people from, as I said, Ireland, Southeast Asia uh, in particular. So much of the variation that we do have is likely to be regulatory in nature or affect regulatory regions of our genome. Um, and there are ways to infer gene regulation, specifically because methylation changes, or we can infer methylation patterns, which turn kind of help turn genes on and off, based on damage patterns that we see in the ancient DNA. And so this was done in a study by Gockman et al. Um, to look at what regulatory regions were methylated particularly differently between archaic humans and modern humans. And um, really interestingly, one of the regions that um, was found to be very different was associated with the face and vocal tract um, in anatomically modern humans compared with archaic humans. And so this is an area where further work to tease out these signatures and what they mean will be very interesting. So I think we can look forward to many exciting insights into anthropogeny from ancient DNA research. Um, and while I have focused on the questions related to archaic humans, um, there's also many interesting projects using ancient DNA to understand human population history in uh, the Holocene, as well as the process of domestication um, and the evolution of human pathogens. And so I think we will um, have a lot of really fascinating findings in the future. Um, I would like to thank not just the organizers of this symposium, but also the members of my laboratory and the funding agencies who have funded our research in the past. Thank you very much.